So I'm going to talk about and demonstrate how to deploy a Linode virtual server with full disk encryption. So I will start off, I'm going to ask obviously a lot of questions and sort of get to that, but I'm just going to give you the spoiler up front. The solution is, is full disk encryption, and I'll talk about what the problem that I'm trying to solve is here in just a minute. But first, a little bit about me. I'm a software engineer and a consultant. I've been programming for a few years, got active in free software in 2002. I also teach computer science at Wright State University. Uh, and um, I'm not really a security guy or security expert. I mean, it's a little bit of, of what I do. I also end up doing a, a quite a bit of systems administration as a result of the type of projects that I get involved in. Um, I just uh, tend to be a naturally very uh, paranoid individual. And so I have uh, found a way to channel that. <laughs> All right, so, um, you know, I'm going to talk about some options for how you would employ encryption in a Linux virtual server environment. I'm going to talk about the threats that are that are mitigated uh, by each, each, each option, and then pros and cons of, of the full disk encryption approach, which is my preferred approach. Uh, and then what types of protection it provides you with and what types of protections it does not provide you with. And then I'm going to actually demonstrate. So I probably should spend maybe like 20-ish minutes on this uh, beginning part. And then the bulk of the time, I'm going to actually, I've got, I've got a good internet signal and uh, I'm connected to my VPN uh, and everything because I've got my Linode account is whitelisted to only my IP at home. Uh, so I'll be able to demonstrate um, the actual process step by step and talk through each step as I do it. And then when I post my slides after the talk, I've already done this uh, b previously and took screenshots at every step. So you'll be able to use those kind of as a memory jogger if that's the, if you want to try to do this for yourself. And then I'm going to at the end talk about some of the unique issues that are associated uh, with managing a Linux virtual server uh, that has full disk encryption. Okay, so so first, uh, you know, let's talk about some different encryption options. You can, uh, of course, do file-based encryption, right? Which is like I have a specific file and I want to protect that file, uh, and so I will encrypt it uh, when it's not being used. Uh, and then, of course, I can do an encrypted volume, and in this type of a setup, typically slash and slash boot will remain unencrypted, and you will pick one or more key volumes, slash home, you know, your varlib postgresql or your maybe post, uh, postfix spool directory, depending on what things it is that you are trying uh, to protect. And those particular volumes and mount points uh, will be encrypted. And then of course, there's the full disk encryption, which is uh, encrypt everything. And, and in this type of a setup, only slash boot will remain uh, unencrypted, and that's because you can't boot an encrypted kernel. The kernel itself has to be uh, unencrypted. There's kind of, kind of chicken and the egg uh, sort of problem there. Uh, but slash and all your other file systems that you might mount, including swap, and I'll get into why that's important later, all get encrypted. <clears throat> uh, so, so first, you know, some of the common issues uh, that you have to deal with, right? So, so more encryption equals less convenience. So you can think of um, you know, security and convenience as being on a one-dimensional spectrum at opposite ends of each other, and you have to decide, you know, where along the spectrum you want to live, right? You can, um, you know, have lots of convenience, right? Open Telnet, no user accounts, very, very convenient, also very, very not secure. Uh, on the far end, you can say, I'm going to leave my server powered off and unplugged, highly, highly secure, not especially convenient. Right, so you got to kind of pick, you know, where where along that that spectrum or that continuum uh, you want to live. So you have to decide how do I manage encryption keys, right? So for example, um, for accessing my Amazon account and my uh, Gmail and stuff like that, I have a YubiKey, right? So this actually has. Uh, the uh, ability to let me do a hardware-based two-factor authentication. You know, very, very secure because even if somebody manages to compromise, uh, you know, like the password database or whatever, without this, theoretically, they can't uh, get in. This is a lot more secure, for example, than using a text message to your phone, right? Who saw that recent article where some folks were actually able to spoof, uh, you know, and or or I guess fake out the system or something like that and were able to intercept text messages that were destined uh, for some people's phones and actually perform the second factor authentication. 
Uh, still, a text message to your phone is more secure than, than nothing else, uh, but you have to think about um, you know, what, that, um, what that means. So, so the keys, uh, a lot of times in, in a very high security environment, the keys will be on a, on a hardware device. Um, in a virtual server environment, we can't do that. Your key material will, in fact, reside on the server, um, and that's typical. For example, if you if you run Linux and like I have full disk encryption on my laptop, and it's set up to where when it boots, it'll ask me for a passphrase. The key lives on on my laptop, and I provided a passphrase, and that's what allows it to unlock the key. So the key remains locked, and that's the kind of a setup that I'm going to talk through when I demonstrate this here in, in a few minutes. Uh, but then you still have to provide the passphrase, right? Um, so, so with a virtual server environment, we can't really do the hardware. It's called, a lot of times they're called HKM, hardware key module, and it's a physical, like a USB dongle or something like that represent, or that you know, resembles the UV key that you physically plug into the server. And then if you unplug it, that machine is no longer, uh, no longer bootable. If you do, um, uh, uh, BitLocker encryption on a Windows uh, laptop, for example, uh, that a lot of times will, if you have a newer <laughs> business-oriented laptop where it has a TPM, a trusted platform module, it will store the key in that. That's considered a secure key storage. If you don't have that, it'll actually write your key out to a USB drive that has to be plugged into your machine. Again, similar concept. But when we're talking about the cloud, the whole point is I don't I'm nowhere near the server. I don't, you know, it's a virtual environment and all that. So um, you have to live with the key actually living on the particular machine uh, or virtual server that you are trying to secure, and then you depend upon the security of the passphrase uh, or the strength of the passphrase to maintain the security uh, of your of your server. So I would argue that this is um, not. If you are truly, truly security oriented, of course you will buy a physical machine and a hardware key module, and you will put it somewhere where you can see it. Uh, but this is sort of kind of a compromise, right? I want to take advantage of the cloud, and I want to have also some level of security beyond um, you know, nothing, which is what most uh, servers that are deployed in the cloud have. So let me take a quick sidebar here for a, for a moment. Um, the, the history here, I used to, uh, going back to my, my just general paranoia that I have. Um, and uh, the approach that I had before was I had physical machines in my basement. And I, I live in a rural area in Ohio, and my choices for internet access were very, very limited. Last year, uh, my provider uh, made some changes that prompted me to seek out a new provider. Um, and I won't get into all those details, but uh, the point was that I made a decision at that point because I was gonna have to make quite a few changes to eliminate the extremely loud rack full of equipment that I had in my basement and was making my basement family room a particularly unpleasant place to spend time uh, and, uh, and get rid of those and move everything to the cloud. Well, I'm very security conscious, so I thought, well, I'm only gonna do this if I can uh, you know, deploy an encrypted uh, solution so I started off by doing uh, sort of a, a trade study and a market survey of the different cloud providers. And Linode was the only one um, that looked like it would be possible to deploy a full disk encryption solution. It's not something they specifically support. There's a few how-tos out there on the internet and I, I read through them. And then I sort of pulled the trigger and was able to make it work and found, as you find with you know any open source how-to documentation, you know, some of it was outdated, some of it was wrong, stuff like that. I was able to figure out things that worked for me, and that's gonna what I'm gonna what I'm gonna take you through here. All right, so if you do file-based encryption, um, that's only gonna protect specific files. You have to decide, um, you know, what files you want to protect, what files you want to encrypt, and and you have to. Uh, then say, okay, this file is encrypted, but when, when I go to use it, it has to be decrypted somewhere. So if the entire system is not in fact encrypted, you have to have a decrypted copy of that file somewhere on the system in order to be able to use it, right? And that may be in memory or, or whatever, uh, but the point is you have to decrypt it in order to use it. Um, now, one, one advantage of this is it's, it's much less likely to impede the boot process, right? If I, if I just want to encrypt 
a you know particular selection of files depending on which files I pick the system may be able to fully boot and be fully up and running without those files being decrypted and then later I would log in and, and decide uh, you know what to do there <coughs> encrypted volumes so you might say well I don't care that much about slash uh, I really care about stuff that's in var right my mail spool and you know things like that so all you need to do is encrypt uh, a particular volume um, that protects all the files under that mount point uh, or directory or whatever um, but you still you would not be able to mount that directory without providing passphrase key whatever um, depending on which mount points and directories you encrypt you may end up impeding the boot process right for example if you say all I care about is slash home you can probably fully boot your server without slash home being there if you say I'm concerned about slash var it is unlikely that you'll be able to fully boot your server because var log lives under var you know you got things like that uh, to deal with um, in, a, in an environment where you are running physical hardware uh, on a network that you control for example you might be able to use a solution like drop bear right where I've got like a little device that I plug into my network and the initial RAM disk the, that, that environment that, that bootstraps the, the machine can actually reach out to another device on the network and say hey I'm here please give me my key material and then it passes it to it in a secure way and what that kind of thing protects you from is you know the guys in the blank black trench coats come in and cart away all your computers well you hopefully you've been very you know smart about how you do this and you hide your little uh, you know network dongle somewhere where they can't find it they cart your computers off they turn them on and they don't boot because they, they have no key material right well you can't really do that with a virtual server as I said um, so the idea is whether you choose encrypted mount points or full disk <coughs> encryption you still have to figure out a way to provide the the uh, the passphrase in order to complete the boot process and and not just that but launching of certain services you know, may have to be delayed until those encrypted volumes are uh, decrypted. For example, if I only um, uh, encrypt varspool postfix, the machine can boot, but I won't be able to start you know mail service until I have actually decrypted that volume and mounted it. Okay, and then full disk encryption protects all the files on the system, um, particularly when the system's off, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but the system cannot 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 be booted at all until you provide a key or and or passphrase right so uh, so there's there's a challenge there right you know the machine sits at a little prompt it says please enter the passphrase and it'll sit there until you give it the passphrase so you have to figure out you know part of part of this whole process is you know is that something that you want to uh, to have to uh, to have to do you know security that that important to you and to me it was so I've got you know a solution that works for me and I'll kind of talk about that and you can decide if that works for you or if something else <coughs> uh, does what you need so some pros and cons are that it provides uh, full disk encryption that is provides excellent protection against many physical attacks right um, uh, it practically eliminates leakage right so you say hey all I care about is var spool postfix okay that's fine but what about temporary files that get created under slash temp what about stuff that ends up in in your swap space right so if those things also are not encrypted even when the machine is off they're vulnerable to offline exploitation so uh, you know the, the, the big thing that this um, uh, well, I guess in a second. Some of the cons are that this, re you know, deploying this type of a solution requires some non-standard steps that may not be well supported. So again, I was able to find some how-tos. I was able to piece together a procedure that worked pretty well for me, uh, but it certainly was not an especially easy process. It took me a few days to kind of work out all the kinks. Um, deployment um, could be more difficult to automate, right? You know, whatever tools you're using, you know, Linode has like a really, really handy thing where it's like, you know, go make me a virtual server with Ubuntu. And then, and that's it. And it gives you an IP address, you log in and it's like magic, right? You can't do that if you want to deploy a full disk encryption solution. You're gonna be doing a lot of manual steps and you may find that some of them uh, can be automated, but perhaps not all. And as I mentioned before, the boot <coughs> process is at a standstill until the passphrase is entered uh, to decrypt the the file system okay so uh, full disk encryption does not protect you from everything so for example it 
and and so you know one of the things when you talk about security and uh, and I like the presentation the little impromptu security metrics uh, I saw in the first hour um, you know you have to think about you know what are you protecting against right what is your threat profile because the question is it secure is utterly meaningless unless you have a threat profile associated with that question right is it secure against nuclear strike maybe not right is it secure against somebody coming in and physically removing the actual hard disks from the server that runs your virtual machine yes it would be secure against that um, somebody takes a file system image of your of your system uh, while it's offline or of the encrypted file system uh, physical relocation of the server right the FBI decides that you are doing something that they do not like, but they want to catch all your accomplices. So they come in and they cart off your server to, uh, to Quantico and they plug it in and they keep running whatever illegal services you're running to try to catch other people, right? They have to shut it down to do that. Well, a full disk encryption solution is going to present an obstacle to, you know, that sort of thing. Or if you're concerned about industrial espionage, you know, if you uh, are, uh, you know, involved in some kind of business where you your company may be a target you know running things in the cloud you have to consider hey could somebody potentially compromise you know my proprietary trade secrets or, or whatever okay probably this is not going to protect you not probably definitely it will not protect you against compromise through a vulnerable running process you know if somebody gets shell code you know through CGI on your Apache server while your machine is up and running sorry you you know you've lost at that point um, SSH, you know, any other vulnerability that attacks the running system is, is a problem. Um, a malicious user in control of the physical host. So one of the downsides about the cloud is that you are inherently trusting the owner of the physical system that hosts your virtual server. <clears throat> That's fundamentally what it boils down to, right? They, you, you have to trust them to a certain level uh, because they, for example, have access to be able to inspect the memory area of your running virtual server. I don't know if anybody's thought about that, you know, in the cloud, but the, the owner of the physical machine can actually do a full dump of the memory area of every virtual machine that's running on it. Anything that's in memory, including decrypted content, is all right there. All right. So think about that, you know, before you upload, for example, your GPG keys to the cloud and, and things like that. But uh, you know, again, though you're not protected against these things. Uh, you do have significant protections uh, from other, uh, you know, types of attacks. So it's, it kind of goes to the whole defense in depths and layers and kind of deciding what sorts of things uh, are important and what threat profile you're trying to protect against. All right. So now we're going to jump over to the interactive portion of the, uh, of the presentation. I'm going to be doing flips, flipping back and forth uh, here uh, so that we can kind of see what's going on. So the first thing that you're going to do is you have to uh, go tell Linode to add a Linode. We're, this is just for demo purposes, so I'm going to do the, the the cheap one. Okay. Then you say add this Linode. Okay. And you can see right there it is being created, <clears throat> and it's going to give me a uh, an IP address and a location. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so uh, I probably should have picked something other than Fremont, but whatever, that's fine. So uh, I have a client uh, who is the one actually that, who I first had the, opportun uh, uh, the opportunity through my relationship with him to actually experiment with some Linode services before even I needed to get into the cloud. And so I found that, that you know, Linode was actually, actually pretty cool and they do have a lot of very you know nice uh, features and whatnot. Uh, sadly, because they are a major cloud provider, they also are frequently the target of denial of service attacks. Um, so every once in a while, I find that you know my machines, one or more of my machines, will become non-responsive. Um, as it turns out, um, I guess particular data centers are more vulnerable than others. Um, so Dallas and Newark tend to be less vulnerable than some of the other ones. I think Fremont and Atlanta tend to be uh, targeted uh, more frequently. Uh, not that that's particularly relevant, but I just kind of thought I'd mention that. All right, so this IP address kind of becomes important here. And uh, we have to then go into the, into the server itself. And we see here, you know, we had initial configuration and everything. Now we need to go make some disks. All right, so first thing we do 
is we're going to allocate a boot disk that's going to remain unencrypted, a swap, and then one that's going to do slash for everything else. So that's going to be an ext4. You don't need very much. I used to say 100 meg was fine. I, I usually go 256 because it's kind of a pain in the butt to have to reallocate um, boot later, and it's uh, you know disk disk space is pretty cheap. You can see there it's creating the file system. Now we go make a swap partition of about two gigs. This server has a one gig, uh, one gig of RAM, so that is more than enough swap. Make sure that you select swap as the type. And then we get swap being created. <clears throat> and then the root file system is whatever's left over. Okay, and that's going to take a second to uh, <clears throat> to create that file system, and then we're able to see right here. There's the root file system that just got created. Okay, now the next thing is we have to create a configuration profile. So, like I said, Linode has a handy thing where you can actually go in there and get like a pre-built system fully deployed, and it's very very handy. We're going to have to make quite a few non-standard configuration choices because um, Linode is not really set up to do this kind of thing in, in an automated fashion. So first we go in to create a configuration profile. I usually uh, name the uh, profile something nice and descriptive. Okay, so para-virtualization, for those of you who don't know, um, Linode uses Zen as their virtualization stack. And, and that was one of the reasons I ended up picking uh, Linode because I've been working with Zen. I thought they switched to KVM recently. Oh, did they? Okay, they, they, they may have. Yeah, they were Zen. Yeah, they were Zen for a long time. And that was one of the things that, that kind of motiva motivated me to go with them because I understood you know, the, the technology pretty well. Um, by default, Linode has this really handy dropdown where you can say, hey, give me any one of these kernels, right? Uh, this doesn't work because you need to be booting off of something in your own slash boot partition because you need your own initial RAM disk that knows that you're doing uh, you know, full disk encryption and is able to um, you know, prompt you for the passphrase and all that kind of junk. So you choose Grub2, <clears throat> and basically this is an option that Zen and KVM and other virtualizations have to basically invoke a bootloader inside of your guest environment. And that's, that's basically what you're doing. So we actually have to install Grub, the Grub bootloader in our virtual server, and that's going to be what's going to actually boot our machine, as opposed to having it do uh, a boot out of the, out of the, um, the, the physical domain where it like, loads a kernel out of there. Um, the disadvantage is if for some strange reason you depend upon any kernel-specific customizations that Linode does, you don't get those by this because you're installing a distro kernel. We're going to install Debian in this demo, so I'm going to get a vanilla Debian kernel. Um, so that works fine for me, but just be aware of that, that you're not getting Linode's customized kernel by doing this. Yes? You started saying something about the virtualization choice, and then you interrupted yourself. Uh, did there Was there anything about that? Or? No, I just I happened oh. to like Zen because I was familiar with it. Oh. Um, and and, and well, that... I meant the... Para versus yeah. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, I wasn't going to say anything specifically oh, okay. about that. I yeah. You started to, so okay. so the difference there, so para virtualization means the guest is aware that it is being virtualized. Full or yeah, full virtualization also called hardware virtualization is like if you're running Windows on a Linux uh, virtual server, that's what you would do. It doesn't the OS does not know that it is being virtualized. So, uh, I choose para virtualization because that's what works with this setup. Um, also, it, the yes can know that it's being virtualized, especially in a Zen setup. I don't know if that's so much true for KVM, but you actually get better performance. It's actually able to optimize I.O. and various other things. Um, so if you can choose para-virtualization, it's almost always a better choice than choosing um, full virtualization. All right, so we leave uh, the default run level. I usually leave the, the memory maxed. Okay, so now we have to choose our, our setup here. So I associate boot with uh, slash dev SDA, swap with dev SDB, and then I make the root partition the uh, uh, dev SDC. <coughs> I leave the init, init RD blank, 
and then I leave the root boot device as dev SDA, which is the one that I chose up here. Okay, now, see all these file system boot helpers? They're like magic. We don't get to use any of them, <laughs> right? So, you know, uh, init, uh, see here, distro helper helps maintain correct init tab upstart console device. Nope, you get to configure that yourself now. Uh, disable update DB. Uh, I always, I, I turn that off. Uh, I, I like um, having my, uh, you know, location database and all that up to date. Uh, I've never run, run into a problem with it. Uh, modules dev helper. Um, we're running our own distro kernel installed in our guest environment. We don't want it generating a modules.dep for us. Um, we do not want dev temp fs auto mounted for us, and we do not want to config auto configure networking. It was already set to no because I've set my account by default to turn off network auto configuration. What that means is you actually have to go in and like manually. You're gonna have to get your own IP address off the console, or, you know, off the summary page, and then actually put it into the. Uh, the OS's network configuration manually. So that's a little bit of an annoyance, but you typically only have to do that once because Linode will give you, you know, static network uh, uh, address assignment. Okay, so now we save changes. And now we have to boot into the rescue environment. Okay, so Linode has something called Phoenix, uh, which is uh, kind of a handy uh, sort of uh, um, you know minimal Linux distro that allows you to do some basic things. Um, so right now I have allocated a server, I've allocated disks, but I have there's nothing on them, right? Those disks aren't even you know there's no file systems on them even yet, right? So if I was configuring a server in a in a data center, right, I would actually walk up to it with a cart and plug into the serial console, or if I had a console server, I would access it via the console server and using media redirection and stuff like that. Uh, this is how we're gonna do this via Linode because I created this in a data center in Fremont, California. I'm not driving down to California. And even if I did, Linode would be very right to not allow me into their data center because they have no idea who I am, right? So this is gonna be how we're gonna get to the server's console um, in a virtual way. So I'm gonna tell it, reboot into rescue mode, and you can see right down here it's doing a shutdown and then it's going to go into a, a system boot so as soon as that's uh, done then we'll be able to log into that. Now the way, I'll, I'll pause here while that's doing that, the way that this works with Linode is they have something called Lish. <coughs> and um, that stands for Linode Shell and what it is, it's effectively it's an out of band management system. So you, as a, as a Linode customer, would have access to Lish, uh, and at each data center, so you have to say, and I'll show you in a second, you know, SSH, Lish, or you know, whatever user at, Lish dash, the name of the data center, dot Linode dot com. And that's gonna give you a very, very restricted um, uh, access to your particular VMs that are running in that data center. Now, the Lish console is really GNU screen. Is anybody not, not familiar with GNU screen? Okay, if you're, I mean, if you do any kind of work with servers, I mean, it's, it's a lifesaver. I run everything in a screen session because nothing sucks like starting off a very long running task. Like whenever I set up a new server, I always generate new SSH moduli um, up to 8K, which takes like three or four days. Um, boy, nothing sucks like SSHing into a server, starting that off, and then, you know, after 20 hours, it disconnects. Um, so you, you know run everything in screen if, if you don't already so that's your public service announcement for the day But if you're not familiar with screen you press control a and then question mark and it gives you a nice little nice little help window All right, so now we're gonna SSH <coughs> into Lish at the Fremont data center And you can see it tells me those are the Linodes that you have in this data center. And then it tells you, by the way, if you're looking for one of your other ones, this is where they are. Because I would have to do like SSH list Dallas to access the console of node 02, for instance. So um, 3073559 is the one I created uh, the other day to do these screenshots. 379105 is the one that I just created right now. So that's the one that we are going to access. Oops. Ta -da. 
and you can see I have, you know, it's TTY as zero. So this is acts exactly like a an actual no kidding serial console to which you would plug in with a null modem cable on a real physical server. It behaves in exactly that that same way. So now the fi the Phoenix environment is a very uh, you know limited subset. You can see it's got. Um, 100, 111 packages installed. I can install additional packages if I need to. I, for what I do, I don't need to because the pretty much the only thing that I do here is uh, format the file systems, set up Lux, and then do a dev bootstrap, which installs the uh, base Debian environment, and then from there we reboot into the server. So I will, um, I'll show you kind of the steps that I take. If you're interested in setting up another distro, Dead Bootstrap will also set up Ubuntu for you. Um, if you're interested in setting up a different distro like Fedora or, or you know CentOS or whatever, you'll have to look into you know what tools you would use to basically do like a command line. You know here install a base system into this directory that I'm telling you to install it to for whatever uh, distro you happen to like to run. <clears throat> okay, so now uh, the first thing that we do is we're gonna do this crypt setup lux format dev sdc that's gonna that is sdc is gonna be our slash partition that's gonna prepare it for the encryption so i do crypt setup lux format dev sdc okay <clears throat> and of course it, it it wants me to type yes in all uppercase this is trying to you know protect me from shooting myself in the head here but I know I just created the disk, there's nothing on it, I really, really do want to obliterate it. Now I have to give it a passphrase. All right, so now you've got to make a decision here, right? So I use key pass X for managing all my passwords. I don't believe in putting my passwords in the cloud for a wide variety of reasons. I mean, what kind of person says, I'm gonna deploy my servers in the cloud with full disk encryption, but then I'm gonna handle my passwords over to another company, yeah, right. Um, and if, if you've, you saw the recent vulnerabilities in LastPass, for example, you realize that giving your passwords over to somebody to manage in the cloud may not be the best idea. So that said, I choose very strong passphrases. I use the pa random password generator. I use 64 character passwords that have like 300 -ish bits of entropy. Uh, so the downside is if I am somewhere where I do not have my laptop or where I'm close to my desktop and my server reboots, I have to get to my laptop or to my desktop in order to be able to provide the passphrase. So I'll get into that uh, here a little bit later on. But for now, I'm just going to use a very simple passphrase. Passphrase. <laughs> What's that? Um, typing a, a long passphrase when you can't see what you're typing is extremely difficult. It is, it is very difficult. So again, you have to make a decision here. The nice thing about something like KeyPass is copy-paste. Uh, which is really nice, you know, in a virtual, I mean, I'm just in a terminal here, right? So, I mean, I'm on the server serial console, but I can just copy paste. Yes. That doesn't work in Glish. It works in Lish. Really? But if you're trying to do Glish, no copy paste. Really? Yeah. I've never, Glish I've never used, awesome. I've never used Glish. Yeah. Glish is good. Yeah. I, I used it, but we'll talk later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So, anyhow, I'm sorry, what's that? Oh, no, I just said I, I run, I work through the Zoom center and I can't copy paste into yeah. console. Yeah, I know. Either. It really sucks. <laughs> there's there's a couple of websites that just really a, just aggravate the heck out of me because they don't allow you to paste into the password field. Some like my local county library website, it's because they try to do some JavaScript nonsense and they disable right click and also kill middle click in the process, <laughs> right? So it's 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 absolutely and, and patently absurd. Now, it's really absurd because they only allow you to have a four digit pin. So, <laughs> so I'm just like, oh, really? Like, I'm like, this is this where you made your stand. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm like, this is wrong on so many levels. Uh, but then there are others that that explicitly uh, preclude pasting, like when you do like a password reset, which is just really aggravating. Like on the on the entry page, they'll allow you to paste the password, but when you're like entering a new password, like in the confirm <laughs> box, they won't allow paste to work into that, which just seems absolutely absurd. Because of course, anybody who really cares about security these days will use a password manager and I really hate having to like unmask and then type the 64 you know random characters that the password did you know generator generated for me but that's better than um, my <laughs> uh, some some years back uh, not that many years ago but I, I started with a new uh, um, provider for my investments and stuff like that uh, after uh, I won't get into the total reason why but when I first signed up with them and they're a very large very very well-known uh, common 
uh, commonly used uh, provider whose name rhymes with Charles Schwab. <laughs> and uh, a few years ago, um, this is an, in an investment house. They limited your password to eight characters. And I'm like, are you people insane? I'm like, I can't, you know, so for a long time I didn't do anything with them because I'm just like, this is just absolutely, completely and patently absurd. Okay. Now I ran into something like that recently with like visas, verified by visa thing. Like, yes. I can't remember the number of characters, but I was, it, I, I set up everything. Yeah. And it's like, <clears throat> that's way too long. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, and that's some of those, you know, where it's like, you know, your password is limited, you know, must be 12 to 20 characters. Cannot have... You know, any, any of these characters, oh, there's no markers, a any, any of these characters, right? And if you look at the list of characters, what are they obviously trying to protect against? SQL injection, right? And, you know, it's like no slashes, no question marks, no angle brackets. I'm like, you people are absolutely insane. If your password field cannot accept certain characters because that's a problem for your application, that's a, you know, that's a major, major, major Little issue. Cable. What's that? Little Bobby Cable. Yep. You know what? I show that every semester to my students during the module on databases. And I, and I threaten them. I, I tell my students that if I ever find out that they built a SQL query by concatenating strings in their programs, that I will descend upon them from the ceiling wherever they happen to be, and I will beat their blo knuckles bloody with a ruler. Um, so most of them are, you know, have a pretty solid understanding of, of you know, string concatenation for SQL queries equals bad. Okay, I'm, I'm like way off track here. So back to this. So yes, 64-character uh, passphrase can be a bit frustrating if you have to manually type it in. As I said, I do it all through KeePass. I actually don't know any of my passwords except for the one that unlocks my KeePass because it just doesn't even make sense to try to know them uh, when they're that long and, and sets of random strings. But the point is, I've now done my, uh, you know, set up the passphrase on my... Um, on my uh, what's going to be my root partition here. Um, if you if you know how Lux works, um, you have multiple key slots, so you can actually have more than one passphrase. So what I encourage you to do, especially if you're like in a team environment, you know, like these three guys are my sysadmins. Do not have the three of them share the passphrase. Have each one of them generate a passphrase and put it in a separate key slot. Any key slot can unlock the device. And then if one of them leaves, we just remove the one from the one slot, as opposed to having to go around and changing all the passphrases on all of our Lux devices across all of our systems. So you yes. do need to know the, one of the existing ones. You have to know. One, so you probably yes. need senior admin to add your junior yeah. admin. Yeah, Some, or do something like that. Yeah, exactly. You know, have senior admin do the junior admins. Or you know, one is somebody generates one and writes it down, puts it in a sealed envelope, you lock it in the safe, or go put it in the you know, company safe deposit box or something like that. And in the event that everybody gets you know, wiped out by you know, a Zika outbreak or who knows what, you know, we go down there and we pull that out and open the envelope and that's how you know, we can get into it. Uh, but yes, you know, there, there's way, and this is not about managing that, but just kind of as a, as a comment there. Uh, I'm the only manager of my systems, so I do the one passphrase and that, and that works for me. All right, so then the next thing is um, we now want to open the device. So we're going to do, uh, we just encrypted it or set it up. So we do crypt setup lux open dev sdc. And this last thing here, root, this is the name that is going to give it inside of device mapper. So if you've worked with like LVM and stuff like that, device mapper, that's, that's how lux works as well. So we're going to do this. I'm going to give it my highly secure passphrase. Okay, and now if I do this, you see I've got a root device in dev map, right? So that is now my decrypted slash dev SDC. I cannot directly access dev SDC now because it just looks like garbage, right? Because it was encrypted. <clears throat> All right, so now I need to make some file systems. So I'm going to do makefs ext4 dev SDA. Now Linode made me a file system. I always like to just, as part of my sequence, I just recreate a file system. I could have left the one that Linode put on there for me. I blew away the one that was on dev SDC because Linode makes you pick a file system. And so now we say make ext4 dev mapper root and it's going to go and it's going to go make me a file system on there. Okay, so now we're going to take a few steps here in sequence. So now we're we are 
some people like to uh, put a passphrase on their encrypted swap. I don't see a need for that. You can tell Lust, it's specifically set up for this, to every time you turn the swap on, like when your system boots, to randomly generate a, uh, a, a key from dev you random. And that works pretty well because whatever was in swap before, you don't want to reuse it. So it stays secure against compromise when it's offline. And the next time it just takes the device and it just reinitializes it. It's basically like running make swap on it fresh every time. It doesn't hurt anybody. In this specific application, definitely on a desktop scenario where you might want to recover some IBM data somewhere. Well, oh yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. In okay, that, yes. In that case, I just put that swap inside yeah, but you do a swap file, right? You can do actually a swap file inside your partition, or you can actually, yeah, you can do a swap volume, or you know, in that scenario, yes, you are absolutely right. In that scenario, I will do a swap, um, a, a swap file inside my encrypted slash partition. But yes, if you trash your swap when your machine shuts down, you cannot. This will not work for a hibernate scenario. So if you're trying to do encryption on a on a desktop or a laptop, be aware of that. Thanks. All right, so let's do. Our crypt setup, crypt setup D, dev you random, create swap, dev SDB. And then the next thing is that we're going to run make swap on the resulting dev mapper device. All right, and so you can see right there, it's what's setting up swap space, two gigs, blah, 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 giving me the ID and everything. All right, and then I wanna turn it on. So I do swap on. <coughs> Duh. Sorry, the latency's a bit there. And then I want to, now, I want to mount my root file system under any directory will work. I'm just going to use slash MNT because it's always present under slash and it's always empty on new systems. So I'm just going to mount it there. That's going to be the target of my execution of dev bootstrap. It's actually going to install the Debian base system into that directory. Okay, and so now we can see right there it's mounted as an ext4 under slash mnt. Okay. All right. So now we're going to run dev bootstrap md64 include. So these are packages that are not part of the. of the default, yeah, that's the right command. Um, these are packages that are not part of the Debian base system. So when you run dev bootstrap, you get a very, very, very minimal system. You get maybe like a couple hundred packages installed. Um, and so I, I, I like to use Vim instead of the, the old uh, VI compatible uh, Vim Tiny that gets installed by default. Open SSH server, because I usually, once we're done with this sequence, I do one reboot into the console to do one last <coughs> thing, and then afterwards I just SSH in and do everything that way. And then crypt setup, because you've got to be able to have those utilities in there, you'll, you'll see in, in a minute, you want to make sure that you have those um, or else booting your server will not work. All right, so we run the bootstrap. Do I have to put boot in there as well? Can I actually not boot it once? Nope, that's the next step. You'll, you'll see why in a second. <clears throat> so this is going to just take a moment here. When I did this uh, the other day to kind of run through my presentation, I think this part took maybe, maybe two or three minutes. Linode has, they mirror uh, all the package repos for all the popular Linux distros internally. So the dev bootstrap in Phoenix points to their, they have like a redirector or whatever. And so it actually, and, and so they mirror it inside each data center. So as soon as it gets the release file and verifies the signature and all that kind of junk, then it'll, it'll all go pretty quickly. Um, let me see here, there was something else that I thought I wanted to mention while it's doing that. 
So this is kind of what the output will look like. It'll you know validate the signature, you'll get a list of packages, and then you'll get a message at the end that says base system installed successfully. And then, um, so while we're waiting on that, what we're gonna do then is then we will mount boot, right? Because that directory, that slash MNT doesn't have a boot directory in it yet. So that will get created when the initial uh, file system hierarchy gets created. We'll mount dev SDA on the slash boot. Uh, we'll mount, uh, bind mount dev and dev TTS and proc and sysfs. And then we will actually chroot into the installed environment to do the, the last, sets, uh, last steps of the setup, which involve like we have to manually create fstab, we have to manually uh, populate mtab, we have to manually populate our crypt tab, stuff like that, uh, because um, you know we need all those things to be properly populated for the server to be able to boot. <coughs> so we're gonna have to wait on, so are there any, any other questions at this point? Yes? You said at the start that you can't, uh, you can't decrypt the encrypted Oh really? The only thing that has to be outside of it is just the EFI blob. Okay. And if you have like if you sign up with your own key with uh, the security, mm -hmm. you can get around a lot of uh, 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 user-made attacks as well. Oh really? I don't know if there's any providers that give you a VM that gives you the EFI. Yeah, I don't. I don't believe Lino does. I'm not aware of any that do. But yes, that's that's a good point. Yeah. So in in this case, yeah, that's true. That when I made the <laughs> statement, I sort of make it made a blanket statement that you can't boot an encrypted kernel. Um, yeah, without access to the hardware. Um, and, and even then you have to jump through a few extra hoops in order to make that work. Yeah, that's true. That's improving a lot. I was kind of disappointed. I was, you know, following the stuff with the Debian 9 uh, release that, you know, they decided not to pursue secure boot. They, they got the, the little stub signed by Microsoft. Uh, so it, it, they can technically do it, but they were concerned because we were pretty close to the release and they were concerned about uh, the possibility of introducing bugs by rush development and stuff like that. So it may not, it may not be until later. They, they talked about possibly at, uh, introducing support for it um, as part of a point release. Uh, but yeah, that'll be that'll be kind of interesting. I was, that was one thing I was disappointed about with this particular laptop that I bought last year. Uh, it came with Ubuntu, which does have secure boot support, and I had to turn off secure boot in order to install Debian on it because uh, Debian doesn't does not yet support that. Interesting. I'm, I'm puzzled by why this is taking so long. Rush hour of creating a server is it? Uh, <laughs> free yeah. bots. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't make an offering to the demo god. <laughs> yeah. I did. I have all the screenshots. I mean, maybe I forgot to like kill the live chicken or something. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. We we may come back to that. I'm gonna I'm gonna walk through screenshots uh, here. And uh, and then we'll kind of jump back, and if it if it does pop up, then I'll actually you know do the steps. So so I talked about you know we're gonna mount the file systems, chroot into the environment. You can see my my prompt changes here now. Root is Finix. The the default uh, for the newly installed system is to have the host name of Finix. Uh, so we're gonna open up Cryptab, which will be a new file, uh, and it'll it'll be empty. It'll have just the comment up at the top. Uh, that is that's what gets installed by crypt setup as an empty crypt tab and then we're gonna tell it our root file system Right, so that's the the target name So that's its name that we want it to have under dev mapper and then the source device in this case the the encrypted uh, You know physical device. I say that in quotes because really Linode's allocated us a virtual device It looks to us like a physical device and so that's how we're gonna treat it <coughs> key file so uh, Linode or sorry uh, Lux has the option for you to have a key file specified. So if you had like a hardware key module, you could actually like physically plug it in the server and then put that there and then you don't have to enter a passphrase. We're telling it none because we want to enter the passphrase on the server's console whenever it's needed. <coughs> and we're just uh, giving it the option that says it's just a standard Lux because it has a couple different approaches uh, that Crypt Setup will, will support. Uh, then for the swap, I'm giving it telling it, give it the name swap, here's the device, I'm telling it, you know, randomly generate your key every time, and the option is, hey, this is a swap. That's how Lux knows it can blow it away, random generate a key, and reinitialize the swap uh, on, every, on every boot. 
<clears throat> After we write that file out, then I get the UUIDs of the um, of the slash boot and the slash root partitions or devices. Now you notice for the slash boot, I just gave it the, the physical uh, device directly, devsda, and then for the root partition, I gave it the device map or device name. Um, we're going to use those in the next step here to populate um, the fstab, right? So we have to, you know, if you use like an installer, like the Debian installer or, you know, Fedora installer or whatever, it handles all this stuff for you. It figures out the UUIDs and like populates all this junk for you because we're doing this via a, a Chiroot bootstrap approach. We have to manually uh, have to manually take this step. So I prefer to specify an FS tab via UUIDs instead of device names because theoretically device names could possibly change, whereas UUIDs will not. Um, so anyhow, I do that and I you know annotate slash slash boot and then just kind of use some some garden variety typical um, F stab options and then I take let's go back over here oh hey look we're we're making progress I guess I guess it was rush hour so then we're gonna cat slash proc mount so proc mount always shows you the current state of the mounted file systems and we're gonna cat that into Etsy M tab to populate that so that way when the system reboots M tab is populated I, I tried going back to see like why is it that I do this and I, I didn't try doing it without I don't know that it's strictly necessary but for some reason I would try on one of the how to's that I found it was specified to do that so I do that it doesn't seem to hurt anything and I haven't gone back to try it without it because I you know deployed like four servers in the last year total and two of them were practice runs for this <laughs> for this presentation so it's not something I do a lot of um, so then I make a directory under slash boot called grub and then I now install grub and a kernel because I don't have a kernel right now so if I were to try to reboot the server it would have nothing to boot so I need to install a bootloader and a kernel and then there's that oh, actually let's uh, we'll jump back up if that's all right and we'll do this for real That's just about done here. <clears throat> Got uh, what about 35 minutes? So I'll feel free to jump in with questions. I think I might, you know, run up pretty close against the uh, the time. All right. So oh, I <laughs> I'm not paying attention to myself here. So we go mount dev sda. Whoops, on mount boot. Then I say mount probind dev mount dev. And then the same thing for dev pts. Mount t proc. Proc mount proc. Mount sysfs. Now we root into the environment. There we go. Now we open up crypt tab. All right, and then I'm going to make entries for root, which is dev sdc none. Lux swap dev std dev u random swap. So that's our file right there. All right, and then um, we need to get our UUIDs. I'm just going to 
whoops, I'm going to redirect these into FS tab so I can copy paste them. And so now we're going to say oops, a little carried away there. UID equals. Yep, and then we say, oh, I got to do swap. In the first line, dev mapper swap non swap. If I was doing this for real, I'd you know worry a little bit more about formatting and stuff. Are you have a typo there? Yeah, on the first two IDs. No, no, no. That, those were from my practice run. Oh, I generate a new file system, so my UUIDs are different this time. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm just looking at this for the rest of the line because I can't uh, type out an FS tab from memory yet. <laughs> <laughs> Errors equals remount RO, zero, 01, BDXT4. You didn't have all that memorized, man. <laughs> no, not yet. Okay, so there's my FS tab. Let's make sure that that is correct, otherwise, the machine will not want to boot. Okay, and then we do cat proc mounts into etc m tab, and this is all. All that is is just the stuff that's mounted. Okay, now we're gonna install grub and the kernel. Apt get install y, and we do grub pc Linux image AMD64. Hopefully this will go a little bit quicker than the initial bootstrap. You know, it, it goes without saying, of course, you want to make sure that your, you know, sources list or, you know, for whatever distro you're using, you're up to date. You've got the security repos in there as well. Everything, you know, you've done an update on the cache and all that kind of junk when you're deploying for real. Okay, so now um, we're, we, we have to install Grub, and you see we've got like all these different devices here. Um, do not install Grub to DevSTC, you're gonna <coughs> screw up your root file system. We only install it to DevSDA, right? So one of the nice things about this you know, virtual server, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm, I'm hoping and praying that Linode has hardware redundancy, so I don't have to do like software RAID. You know, like if you're installing like a you know software RAID, you know you install have to install Grub to like multiple devices. You know, we don't have to worry about junk like that. We just say install to Dev SDA, and that's it. Why are there two SDAs? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yep. Good question. I do not know. Um, okay. <clears throat> All right. So now, this right here is without a doubt the most important step. If you mess this up, you will not be able to access your server's console to give it the passphrase. And then your server is not really useful. <laughs> All right. It's very secure, though. Well, yes, it is very. Well, it's secure from you. I mean, other people may be able to get into it. All right. So now you're on your distro, the. Uh, actually, it's default grub. Uh, the, the location of, this, of these options may be a little different. All right, here on Debian, it's Etsy default grub. All right, so I um, have to change a couple things. So this is what it looks like before, and this is what it looks like after. So first thing is I increase the timeout to 10. Okay, then here, um, and I don't remember now, I think I think the C group enable equal memory swap account is what my, I, I do on like my other virtual machines that I've, or virtual servers that I've deployed. Um, I don't know that that's particularly uh, important 
for this, you know, deploying a full disk encryption, but I'm going to go ahead and do it since I haven't tried it without. You can make the underscore in secret. Oh, yep, you're right. Oh, we'll go back to that in just a second. Yep. Good catch. Thank you for that. All right. That is, again, I said I, I typically do that. This is the one that you absolutely, absolutely have to, have to, have to, have to get. Okay. Without this, by default, you will not get a serial console. Okay. By default, you don't get a serial console on Linux unless you tell, unless the bootloader tells the kernel to allocate the device. If you miss this step right here, as I said, you will have absolutely no way because you can get onto that virtual console through Lish, but if your machine is not outputting stuff to the serial console, you just get a blank screen. Okay, it's like having your monitor cable unplugged. Okay, it's just not going to do you any good. So we say console equals TTY as zero. There we go, 19208. And this was one of the areas where I had to do some experimentation. In my previous uh, experimentation, Zen had different, and, and maybe I had to change this when they switched to KVM. Zen had different names for this, like you would do um, HVC0 and you know other different things, just depending on how your you know your setup was. Uh, but this was the what works for me now under the current uh, Linode setup. Then we have to give it the serial command. Uh, for grub if you want to see the bootloader output. So this one up here, uh, grub command line Linux, that makes the kernel output to the serial console. If you want to see grub on the serial console, you also have to do this next line. Otherwise, you will not have a way to, for example, go boot into single user mode or have a way to modify the kernel command line options from the bootloader screen unless the bootloader is also sending its output to the serial console. <coughs> So we say grub serial command equals serial, oops. Doesn't like your S. Uh, did I? I was, uh, I had dead keys on, sorry. I was typing something in Spanish earlier. Okay, serial. Your quote is not, yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. I got an umla instead of a quote. Ah, yes, thank you, thank you. Yes. <coughs> Yeah, this works much better with crowdsourcing. I can't tell you the very first time I did this, how many things I screwed up, you know, and I'm like, okay, let's go delete that Linode and start over. Um, so it took me quite a few tries to, you know, get this all squared away. 19.2, unit zero, word eight. I already know. Stop one, okay? That look uh, the same to everybody? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> and that's it. Again, these are by far the two most important things in this entire process because, again, Linode is not set up. You know, they have their nice little hand dandy, you know, things and all that kind of stuff. Their kernel, if you boot their own kernel, all this stuff happens for you automatically. But if you're doing a full disk encryption setup where you're installing a distro kernel in the guest environment, you've got to set all these things up for yourself. Okay. Now we have to, uh, let's see here, um, we have to run update grub. If you're going through these slides later, you know, bear in mind on some of these because I, I didn't think it made sense to do like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, twelve screenshots for something where it's like one line at a time. So I do have sometimes where I have multiple steps on a particular screen. So we run update grub and then it will you know, re regenerate its configuration and whatnot from the defaults file. If you're using a different distro, you're gonna have to look at what the procedure is and what files you update and all that kind of stuff. All right, so now we switch into boot. And if you're familiar with how Grub works, when you have boot mounted to a separate partition, you gotta do a little, a little bit of trickery here. So I'm gonna move Grub, move the Grub directory into the boot subdirectory of boot then I'm going to create a symlink, and this allows me to, you know, actually change, have Grub be able to find itself on the separate file system, but also have it in the running system. When I do things like run update Grub, the right files get updated in the right place. Can't you just do that with Mountpoint? Uh, I probably could, but this is how I've always done it on all my other servers. But so I, I use this on my own yeah. VM environment. And yeah. I just mount that boot file system twice. Right? Yeah. No, I just mount it once. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, 
Yeah, you can do that. All right. So now, whoops. After that, we set the root password. Ah. And that's what I get for trying to type and talk at the same time. Okay. Hey, look at that. It printed my actual password. It shouldn't do that. <laughs> All right. At least somebody got that. A few people. All right. So now we get to set up our networking. All right. Oops. Etsy network interfaces dot D and then I just call it Linode default again you'll have to you know depending on you know your distro if you're you know CentOS it'll be Etsy sysconfig or you know just whatever whatever it is <clears throat> so now I set up um, everything here to do um, you know just to, to do automatic um, automatically bring up the uh, the interfaces and then we'll set the IP address under Etsy network interfaces I think so we say auto low zero I face low inet loopback I face low inet six loopback so this will just create the right interfaces that I need I face e zero and at six auto okay then we edit the host file or actually yeah I guess that's right so Linode they have a, a kind of a nice DHCP setup and you know you can tell it hey pick up all your stuff off of DHCP and then all you need is the IP address in the uh, uh, what do you call it in the uh, in the host file. At least I, I believe that's the case because I don't have, um, let me see here. Yeah, I believe that should work. We'll see. I some, For some reason I have this kind of like odd feeling like I missed a step, but I thought I went through this a couple times to make sure. All right, so now we wrote the, uh, or now we gotta do the host file. We gotta go back over here and we have to get our IP address right here. Okay, and there is the host name. I'll I'll just use that one as the default because it's easy. Okay, and then we go here. Paste the host name. So just so I have a entry for the actual host that I am here and then that's just a comment there at this point you got to remember you're in GNU screen so you have to disconnect from it with control A control D and now you can see I'm back out in the lish environment right here so the server is still running and then now you do a reboot now I have to do reboot too I know the example said one because I only had the one up there but you tell it reboot and then which number and you know in the, in the order uh, that they are right there and so I say reboot 2 and then if I go back over here to my dashboard it will actually show me I'm shutting down I'm in rescue mode or you know uh, it says yeah wait initiate boot rescue mode so what it should do I believe is even though here it says rescue mode uh, it should actually s just boot into the regular environment <laughs> At least that's what it did for me. No, it only boots into rescue when you go into rescue and say reboot into rescue. Um, yeah. Okay, so now if you're still in Lish and you ran a reboot, it'll tell you. It'll tell you. Oh yeah, I guess it did reboot into rescue. Huh? That's really odd. Okay. Well, let's make it reboot into. Let's make it reboot into the configuration profile that I set up for it. Somewhat optimistic with a one day uptime. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, they round up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. 
So while that's doing that, this will be what the actual prompt will will look like uh, when it, when it comes up. So I forget on my other machine I do I resolved the you know grub video fb get region thing and I could I couldn't remember how I did it and I. Um, I had to like this past week final grades were due for me at school so I was very busy doing like a grading marathon for like a week because I kind of fell behind uh, during the semester so I didn't get a chance to go refigure this problem out. Well that's taking a long time. What's that? And it boots without it. Yeah <coughs> yeah exactly. I, I think it has to do with like the video mode line or whatever and that you give it in Etsy default grub or something like that, at least it has been on my other machines. Um, but I just, like I said, I didn't didn't have time to go fiddle with that. Okay, yeah, here we go. System shutdown complete. So now I want to go over here and tell it, hey, go boot, and it's going to, you know, you can have multiple configuration profiles. So there we go. Debian Jesse with FDE, so it's booting the boot profile. And then what we should see is our Lish should automatically pull up that console again like it did before think. Well, actually, what we can do is this. We can just type the name of the Linode, and it'll, whoops, I have to exit out of that first, go back out to the main Lish, and then say, boom, there we go. Okay, there we go. So in just a second, it's going to ask me for the uh, passphrase for DevSDC. <coughs> oh, there we go. So the grub timeout finished. Um, Why did you even increase the timeout to 10 minutes? I just don't like the, the because if my connection is slow or whatever, oh, the five okay. second timeout may not be enough time to get in there. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would show you, I mean, everybody knows what a grub boot screen looks like. So you would just have to, you know, resolve the thing with the, the, the video mode or whatever. And I forget what it is, but there's something else that I had to do. My two servers that I've actually got this working on are, um, oh, let's see here. I messed up something. <laughs> okay, so here's what we will do. I'm glad I didn't delete that other one yet. <laughs> We're gonna go to my one that I created the other day that is in fact working. Looks like a UUID was typoed from what's there or what. Yeah. That, that's one of the dangers uh, there. All right, so let's do this. Let's go back out to the Linodes. Let's go over to this guy here. And then let's tell it to reboot. <clears throat> okay, so while that's doing that, I'll kind of go through the rest of these slides here. You get to the login screen. Uh, I'm not going to do this because I've already done this on the other server, right? Uh, you log in, and then right here in this area, you can see I basically set the host name to whatever I want. So, you know, I, I just keep the host name and empty host name. Then I do host name dash capital F, which is set the host name from whatever's in this particular file. And then I log out, and then you can see that it picked up uh, the new host name after I set it. And that's the, that's the last step. At that point, I mean, SSH is running. Uh, you know, the root password that I set, I could use. I can't remember. I think the default is to not allow root login with password. So you'd have to go in there and, like, load an SSH key for root to be able to log in or set up a user or, you know, whatever else. But the machine is now fully set up. Okay, so here we go. So here's our prompt. This is what you'll see. You just type in the passphrase. And then you just get the regular, you know, sequence of, of boot messages. In this case, it's a quiet boot. But then it comes up to a login prompt, and I'm on the server's basically serial console. So this right here is kind of the special, you know, like, well, gosh, you know, I've got to be, I, I've got to have a way to provide that passphrase. So the way that you do that is, you know, you log into Lish, and then you type in the name of the of the Linode that you want to access, and it brings up its console, right? So. You're like, but how do I know when I need to do that? So one of the nice things, and I'm going to have to go, you know, clean these out of my email here in a few minutes. Um, Linode can be configured to email and or text you. And when I say text you, you know, you can do like your phone number at whatever your providers is. They all have an SMS to email gateway. And you can set Linode to email you or text you whenever one of your machines reboots, 
right? Now, it's not a particularly, you know, these are not physical hardware machines, you know, like where your power supply is going to, you know, flake out or you're going to have like a power surge or whatever. You know, they're in a data center, so it's highly unlikely that it's going to reboot. But I have mine set to whenever a machine reboots to um, send me uh, an email and a text message. So then I know, oh, oh, I just got a thing. One of my servers rebooted. I need to go now SSH into Lish, get onto the console, and type in the passphrase to allow the boot sequence of the server to continue. Okay, so that's how I know that I need to go do that because otherwise I would have no way of knowing. My main server is also my mail server, so that kind of presents kind of a very interesting uh, problem for me. Um, I, if anybody's interested in the gory details, I'll explain to you later how I, how I do it, but I basically have a thing set up in Postfix where if the, on my backup, so, so I have a backup server that also has a, set, a Postfix set up running on it, and so I have Postfix on that machine set up so that if an email comes in, to the notification email address that I've given Linode to send me notifications to, it doesn't try to send it to the primary MX like a backup MX will almost always try to do. It just automatically relays it only for that one email address. So Linode will try to hit my primary MX, find that it's not there, send it to the backup. The backup will then actually send it directly to my telephone. And that's how if my primary mail server goes down, that's how I get notified. Otherwise, any other server that I have, it'll just go through the normal, you know, they send an email, my mail server gets it, and then forwards it onto my phone, basically. Um, so really, you know, the, the, the key thing, the, what you have to have to really make this all work is you have to have the out-of-band access, right? Because ordinarily, you know, for a laptop or a desktop, the machine boots, and it sits there and says, please give me the passphrase. And you just type it in with the keyboard. Well, we don't have a physical keyboard associated with this virtual server. So really, it's all about Lish for accessing the server's virtual console. And you have to have the configuration um, you know, done correctly, or else you're not going to get uh, output on the console. If the server is bootable, for whatever reason, I mean, you just do normal troubleshooting. You SSH in, just like you would any other server. And if the server, for some reason, is not bootable, like the one that I screwed up, I typoed the you know UUID or whatever I did wrong in that, I would then go into Lish and I could go back into the console and tell it, hey, boot into rescue and then let me you know sort out the problem and then after that, you know, boot like normal. So really what enables this is the really nice access that Lino gives you via Lish for that out of band access. I don't know if other cloud providers have matched that yet, but when I first started doing research on this a little over a year ago, Nobody else had anything that even remotely did. So, you know, you could find how to's, for example, for Server Beach and EV1 on, you know, here's how you have an encrypted home partition. Here's how you have an encrypted VAR. Here's how you have a blah, blah, blah. But there's no way to do the full disk encryption because you have no way to get involved really early in the boot process. It's got to load the kernel. You actually have to get the boot process going far enough along that you can actually then remotely log into the server uh, via, you know, SSH or whatever to do the, the normal. Uh, type things. Uh, so again, that may have changed with some of the other, you know, uh, cloud hosting providers. But at the time, uh, you could not make the full disk encryption work uh, on anybody but but Linode. So that's you know what I started using. And on top of that, they they're pretty good. They're very open source friendly, and they support open source and all that. So I I like them uh, from that perspective. <coughs> so these are what the notification emails look like right here. So it'll say hello, you know, whoever <coughs> following activities recently occurred. It'll say you know, system shutdown, system boot into rescue mode, you know, and it'll give you the time and everything like that. <clears throat> you know, here's the, uh, the one where, you know, initiated shutdown, initiated, you know, Lish initiated boot, uh, Lassie initiated boot, that's the, uh, um, that's the, the uh, dashboard, the Linode manager. Um, so that was me, like, you know, pressing the reboot button in the web interface, for example. So I get this email, right, and I'm like, oh, I, one of my servers just rebooted. I need to go, um, you know, go log in and, and provide the passphrase. <clears throat> All right, that is the show. Questions? Yes, sir. Does your system always allow you enough access to troubleshoot it? Um, obviously, when it's new, if you can say, well, it's going to be easier in my time to just blow it away and do it again. Yeah. But yeah. So you can, you can you can manually with you can do like crypt setup lux open to open the device and mount it. On a, and to root into it via Phoenix yes. if that's what you need to do. So yes, that is all that's available. Yes, over here. So I'm still not exactly convinced by the premise, right? So okay. if, uh, if they have access to RAM and be able to jump to HTTP, yep. how is that even better than just having the unlisted files on their server? 
Okay, so it just depends on what threat profile you're trying to protect against. Suppose law enforcement walks in, you know, with a national security letter and a gag order and says, you know, here, you know, give me, give me the, you know, an image of the file system of Roberto's virtual server. They're probably not going to think to ask for a memory dump as well. So I, I don't, I don't know. It, it may, that may or may not be the case, right? So the thing is, it doesn't protect against everything, you know. So it's in my particular, you know, threat profile, this is sufficient. So yes, there are gaps there, um, but. Um, yeah, I mean that's you know that that that's just that's just a vulnerability you gotta you gotta live with. So.